Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, of course, I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, you heard the President's remarks uh, at the end of his uh, bilateral meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, at which, uh, in addition to his comments about uh, the meeting, about our relationship with Israel, uh, our unshakable support for Israel's security, uh, the discussions the two leaders had about Syria and Iran and the Middle East peace process, among other things. The President took a question and answered it about the fact that, uh, as of now, uh, it is up to the House of Representatives to decide whether or not they want to shut down the government in order to make an ideological point, or whether they will follow the Senate's lead and uh, pass a extension of government funding at current levels uh, for a number of weeks so that we can get about the business of discussing and negotiating uh, a longer-term budget agreement. With that, I will take your questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the President just said about having conversations with leaders on the Hill? Does that include Speaker Boehner, and is he making any progress in these talks toward averting a shutdown? I think the President said what we've said, which is that you can expect that he will be having conversations with leaders on the Hill, uh, as he has in the past. Uh, and I, I assume that would include the Speaker of the House. The point, I think, though, is that we are at a moment where the House of Representatives has to decide, and the Speaker of the House is the leader of the House, and the leader of House Republicans must decide whether roughly 60 members of his caucus, the Tea Party faction, uh, will dictate to the American people whether, that, uh, whether the government will shut down because uh, they have not been able to achieve through normal means uh, their ideological agenda, which is to repeal and do away with in, do away with in some manner or other the Affordable Care Act. The irony, of course, being that tomorrow enrollment begins in the Affordable Care Act and millions of Americans for whom access to affordable insurance has been but a dream, there will be the opportunity to enroll in the Affordable Care Act through the exchanges in the marketplaces uh, and uh, receive, come January 1st, affordable health insurance for the first time. And that's going to happen. Uh, nothing will alter that. That will happen. So a couple of follow-ups on that. Can you say whether he's spoken yet to Speaker Boehner? I, I don't have any other conversations or new conversations to read out. I think what the President indicated is that uh, he expects that he will, of course, uh, speak with leaders uh, in the coming days. Again, there's nothing here to uh, debate that the President has made clear all year long that he is willing and eager to negotiate over our budget priorities and to reach a common sense solution to funding our government. Uh, that's what his budget was about, which many of you wrote about and, and uh, correctly assessed to represent uh, compromise. Uh, and we have uh, encouraged Republicans to show the same willingness to compromise all year long, and the President has met with many uh, members of Congress of the Republican Party over the course of the year to have those discussions. What he will not do is uh, go along with the idea that the government should be shut down over uh, this desire to unwind history uh, and achieve through uh, threat and extortion what Republicans couldn't do through the legislative process or through the election process. It's just not fair to the American people. It's not fair to the millions of Americans who uh, will have access to affordable health insurance for the first time. Would the President veto a continued resolution that only included a provision killing the medical device tax? We have said that at that's, none of this is acceptable. This is just a blatant extortion. And the irony about it is, like the Republicans will tell you, or the Republicans who support this uh, extortion game or extortion racket will tell you that, oh, well, you know, that's, a, that, that's compromise. We just want you to do this on the Affordable Care Act and chip away at it here or delay there. And yet, they'll all also tell you very quite clearly that the goal, the ultimate goal and purpose of this is to do away with the Affordable Care Act, so take away all those benefits from millions of Americans. 
uh, and increase the deficit dramatically while doing it, something they never mention. Uh, but uh, in the end, they want to do that for uh, a continuing resolution that will fund the government for 45 days, 60 days. What comes next? What will they demand next? I mean, I, part of it was they want to they want everybody's boss to be able to tell them, to tell every woman in America that whether or not they can get contraceptive coverage. They want to attach that uh, to this debate. You know, this is, this is not, as uh, others have said, this is not the way Congress ought to operate, and it's irresponsible and reckless to hold the functioning of the government hostage uh, to these ideological imperatives. There's no sign of any movement, Jay. Isn't a shutdown inevitable this evening? Well, the President said uh, just now, and I certainly agree with him, that uh, no, that he is not resigned to a shutdown because there's an avenue open to the House uh, after the Senate does what we expect, which is send back to the House a clean CR that just continues funding the government at current levels. It, it contains no concessions to the Democratic agenda or the President's agenda just continues funding the government at current levels uh, for a number of weeks in order to allow for the negotiations the President is eager to engage in. Uh, that's the responsible thing to do. The irresponsible thing to do is to uh, attach a bunch of political, ideological demands uh, to this simple proposition of funding the government and not shutting it down, uh, and uh, you know, say you'll shut it down if you don't get what you want. But you're not detecting any signs of any movement. Well, I, you know, I used to walk the halls of Congress as a reporter and, and back then knew a lot more about the minute-by-minute -minute developments. Uh, in fact, I did that uh, during the last government shutdown, uh, here in 95 and up there in 96. But I, I leave it to your colleagues to tell me more precisely what the thinking of the House Republican leadership is. How will a, a, a shutdown affect White House staffing? Well, the White House, like other uh, agencies within government, is affected. There will be uh, reductions in staff. We'll have a skeletal staff. Uh, there's obviously uh, essential staff that's exempted uh, or accepted, which I think is the proper term, and that's true in other areas. Uh, but you know, it will be a uh, extremely lean operation if this comes to pass. And, and lastly, will he go on this trip to Asia this weekend? We don't have any changes to announce. Uh, we plan to make this trip. The president, as president looks forward to and believes it is important to travel to Asia in order to promote our economic interests in Asia and our strategic interests in Asia. Uh, there are uh, American jobs that can be created through our engagement with Asia, this fastest growing region of the world uh, and an enormously important region when, it, region, uh, when it comes to our trading relationships and partnerships. So, uh, you know, we, we have this trip scheduled and we uh, intend to take it, you know, we'll see obviously what happens as the week unfolds. I'm going to move around a little bit, if I may. Uh, April. I want to follow up on what Steve said. Um, you said there will be a skeletal staff mm -hmm. and a lean operation indeed if the shutdown happens. Could you get into the breakdown? Could you give us numbers? I would refer you to the Office of Management and Budget, which handles all of these uh, specifics uh, and can, can give you more information about how it breaks down. But those of you who know from uh, if, if you're as, uh, uh, as old as I am and remember what, uh, what it was like in uh, the mid-90s, and, and remember also what you reported just when there, were, there was at least the potential of a shutdown, uh, there are uh, significant reductions in staff and furloughs that take place uh, here as elsewhere uh, if, if a shutdown occurs. And, and that staff that will be uh, not coming in or furloughed will not be paid, correct? Again, I, I, that's my understanding, but I, 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 ha I hesitate to answer these kind of technical questions because uh, there's, uh, there are far uh, uh, better sources for that in specific information. And we're understanding that today that even the White House is trying to still uh, parse through all the technicalities of the effects on the White House from a shutdown. Is that the case? And if so, could you talk to us about some of the things that you're dealing with? Look, here, here's the thing. There, there are effects here. And there are effects throughout uh, the government. But those pale in comparison to the effects and impacts that a shutdown would have on women and children and seniors. Uh, shortly after a shutdown, if it were to occur, federal funding for the Women, Infants, and Children program uh, may not be sufficient to cover benefits and agencies 
may have to cut off services to mothers and young ch children. Senior nutrition grants, which help approximately 2.5 million seniors annually, uh, help them re uh, remain healthy and independent by providing meals and related services, would not be funded. Programs that our nation's veterans depend on would be affected. For example, veterans call centers and regional offices would be closed immediately, effective immediately. So those services that help veterans understand their benefits, including call centers, hotlines, and regional offices would be closed. Vocational rehabilitation and education counseling for veterans would be limited. Veterans business support centers would be immediately closed. And should a lapse extend through late October, compensation, pension, education, and other veterans' benefits would be cut off. Uh, important research and consumer safety programs would be halted in the event of a shutdown, including research into life-threatening diseases, uh, work to protect consumers, ranging from pro child product safety to financial security to the safety of hazardous waste facilities, would cease. Uh, the Sandy recovery efforts, the West Texas investigation and other fire and emergency response, response grants would be halted. Uh, and on that, uh, I just want to point out that when it comes to disaster, emergency disaster relief, there is the fund that is operational. So should there be uh, a disaster, there would be funding available for initial and immediate emergency relief. But what would be affected by a shutdown are the ongoing Sandy recovery efforts and the investigation into the explosion in West Texas and the like. So, those are, the, those are the impacts and effects that matter. Far, you know, we, you know, we like every other agency would be affected, uh, uh, but it's, it's folks out in the country who will be affected that uh, concerns us most. Okay, thank you for that uh, mm -hmm. information, but again, how will the President plan to go to Asia if there's a schedule, a uh, skeleton crew, and mm -hmm. a lean operation I, here, and then also how Again, the ACA President affect? said today, uh, not long ago that he is not resigned to the idea that the government will shut down. He remains hopeful that the House will uh, come to the reasonable decision that it is appropriate to simply extend funding of the government further for several weeks uh, in order to allow for the kind of negotiations that they claim they want uh, about our budget priorities. Uh, so he remains uh, hopeful, or at least uh, not resigned, to the uh, fact of a shutdown. And when it comes to the mechanics of the trip and the, the, the people and, and equipment that gets uh, positioned abroad for a trip like this, I just would have to refer you to OMB or to the agencies involved, Department of Defense, Secret Service. Uh, Jim and then John. Uh, Jay, uh, one of the other proposals floating around up on Capitol Hill would be a really, really short-term CR, something along the lines <coughs> of a week to keep, to keep the government running. You from this podium in the past uh, have described that as sort of toll booth government or, or even these continuing resolutions as toll booth government. Wouldn't a one week CR be sort of the ultimate toll booth government? Well, I'm, I'm not going to respond to ideas floating around the hill. There are tons of them and we can respond all day to them. Right now the option available, as I understand it, uh, uh, to the House, to the Speaker, uh, will be uh, the opportunity to follow the Senate's lead in funding the government for a number of weeks. Uh, in a clean continuing resolution, and we would support that. Uh, you know, this process, again, has been one where uh, a small faction, a very extreme faction of Republicans in the House uh, has uh, essentially forced its leadership to go along with the proposition that it is better to shut down the government with all of the negative effects that we've talked about, and better perhaps to default on our obligations for the first time in history. Uh, than to allow a law that was passed and signed and upheld by the Supreme Court to be implemented. A law that would provide millions of Americans who do not have insurance access to affordable insurance. And one might surmise that the extreme agita that you see among Republicans right now over the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare is a direct result of the fact that beginning tomorrow there is a concrete uh, development that means that millions of Americans will for the first time be able to sign up for that health insurance. And as I think I've seen Republicans say, uh, it'll be a lot harder to get rid of Obamacare once uh, these individuals who have had a hard time getting affordable health care uh, are able to see the benefits of the Affordable Health Care 
uh, the Affordable Care Act provides to them. So again, I'm not going to negotiate ideas that are floated to me from any row of this briefing room, except to say that you know we don't think uh, extraneous political agenda items ought to be. Uh, well, maybe from the front, but but but. <laughs> uh, I think I'll just make it make it blanket uh, blanket opposition to that. But 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 just to just to, let me just say that that you know, Congress ought to do its job. It only has a few absolute functions, and one of them is to ensure that the government uh, and its essential operations are funded. Another is to ensure that the United States pays its bills as it has throughout uh, the entire history of the nation. And, and Jay, let me just mm -hmm. follow up real quick. In the last couple of weeks, uh, Democrats, uh, in, including the President, have, uh, and he has not used all of these words, but I'll throw out some of them that have been used, uh, have referred to Republicans as arse, arsonists, anarchists, mm -hmm. extortionists, blackmailers. Uh, I think I just said extortion takers, racket, yeah. Uh, Dan Fiver talked about bombs being strapped to chess. It almost sounds as if this White House is trying to taunt Republicans into shutting the government down. Uh, well, that's certainly not the case. I mean, I, as I think I just saw my colleague uh, Dan Pfeiffer on uh, CNN's air not long ago say that, uh, uh, I think it was Mitch McConnell who, in this iteration of these negotiations, similar ones two years ago, who referred to uh, the economy <laughs> being a hostage that they could take in the negotiations with the President. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, this is language that uh, either side has uh, exclusive rights to or has only used in the past. But here's the facts. There, when it comes to funding the government or when it comes to paying our debts, the Democrats and the President, on the one hand, are asking for nothing, no concessions, no ideological riders, no, you know, special pet projects, no uh, political gotcha items. Uh, in exchange for the simple extension of government funding, in exchange for Congress ensuring that we do not default. Republicans, on the other hand, are attaching to, uh, in, in the concrete bills that they've passed and in, in uh, their imaginations anyway, when they talk about what they'd like to attach, all sorts of political agenda items, some of them wildly inconsistent with where the American people want uh, the country to move. And, and that includes uh, uh, issues that are wholly unrelated to the budget and wholly unrelated to uh, the debt and the deficits that we uh, must manage and, and the responsibility of Congress to ensure that we don't default. John Allen. Uh, two questions, Jay. One following on Jim. Uh, this is no longer such a hypothetical. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has hotlined a one-week CR on the Senate mm -hmm. uh, within the last few minutes, maybe hour. Uh, so it looks like there's some movement on that on Capitol Hill. And you said the Congress has the responsibility to keep the government funded. I wonder what the president signed. Yeah, I, well, you just are. mentioned this happened in the last couple of minutes, so I wanna, I'm not going to give you a, a statement of administration policy, except to say that it has long been our position that Congress ought to make sure that the government doesn't shut down and they ought not to attach to its, their responsibility to ensure that the government doesn't shut down uh, any ideological poison pills or you know, any uh, agenda items that they can't achieve through the normal uh, process. Uh, but, you know, we'll have to see what Congress does. Uh, there's a lot of movement in Congress that doesn't result in actual action. And on the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. uh, will the President be doing anything tomorrow uh, to promote the rollout? And can you talk a little bit about what the White House is going to be doing more broadly? Well, I don't have any uh, information uh, at this time for you on the President's schedule tomorrow. It is certainly the case, and I appreciate you bringing it up, that, you know, Department of Health and Human Services and others are uh, engaged uh, in preparing for tomorrow's uh, opening day of enrollment. And uh, there's a lot of activity around that. And uh, it will be the first day of a six-month open enrollment period for individuals to basically shop for uh, health insurance in a, in a way that they've never been able to before. And, and for so many of them to have options available to them at affordable prices that they've never had before. And we expect that when those uh, marketplaces open and the exchanges open and you can, uh, as a consumer, uh, review your options either online or uh, uh, through the uh, telephone call centers, uh, there'll be a lot of window shopping. A lot of people will assess what's available to them. And then uh, as time passes and we move closer to January 4th, more and more 
uh, of the millions of Americans who have this option available to them will take advantage of it. And, and that will be a very good thing indeed. John Carl. Chair, are these briefings essential? Will you continue to brief? In <laughs> uh, we obviously believe it's important that the uh, American people be apprised of uh, what's happening here at the White House, and we will uh, uh, endeavor to provide that information as best we can with a skeletal staff. Are, are you confident that this will be a political disaster for Republicans if they uh, shut down? I, I wouldn't make any kind of predictions, and, and I that that. That suggests that we're looking for an outcome. I, I, I'm not. I mean, I don't know. And I and and honestly, I think it's important to know that uh, we don't care about the politics of this. The president cares about making sure that the American people aren't hurt by it, because you know we talked about this in when, when, with regards to the comprehensive immigration reform legislation that passed with a strong bipartisan majority in the Senate, and there were some questions about whether you know secretly we didn't hope that the Republicans in the House would block it because it would be bad, continued bad news for the Republicans when it came to their uh, ever worsening relationships, uh, relations with Hispanic Americans across the country. And, and the answer is no. We would love them to take advantage of the uh, political opportunities available to them by passing comprehensive immigration reform and maybe improving their standing among Hispanic Americans by doing it. And we would love for Republicans to do the right thing uh, and maybe. Uh, improve their standing among uh, the American people and Congress's standing among the American people by simply not shutting down the government and not defaulting on our obligations. So can I just go through very quickly some of what the Republicans are demanding and, and what's negotiable, what's not. Uh, the debt ceiling, nothing there negotiable, right? Correct. Uh, the idea of repealing uh, the health care law, obviously not negotiable. Delaying the health care law for a year? No. Not As part of, I mean, first of all, the answer is no, and nothing is negotiable when it comes to the debt ceiling. And as the president said recently, when it comes to extending the government, it's like he's willing to talk about ways to improve the health care law if Republicans uh, are interested in that. After all, a lot of the Affordable Care Act is designed, uh, its, its essential elements were designed by Republicans. Uh, you'd think, and I believe, that there are Republicans out there who uh, probably earnestly have some good ideas, uh, although they're most likely afraid to talk about them in party circles. But the, you know, the president is eager to do that. What he is not willing to do is uh, have those uh, d negotiations under the threat of shutting down the government, and certainly not under the threat of defaulting on our obligations. So, so the idea of delaying this tax or, or cutting this tax on medical devices also? No, I answer that with NEDRA. That, that's, that's not, look, Congress has, throughout the, its time in session, the opportunity to consider and pass legislation uh, to try to get majorities big enough in both houses to achieve a, a compromise between the House and the Senate and present it to the President. That's the way it worked. It, it is supposed to work. And as you know, the House Republicans in particular have uh, done little else uh, over the past couple of years than attempt to uh, legislate ways that either defund or repeal or other ways uh, uh, negatively affect the Affordable Care Act. So that they they can certainly endeavor to keep doing that. But to, to have that attached to the simple responsibility to fund the government is just not acceptable. So is the reason why we've seen really no negotiations going on, because basically everything the Republicans have put out there is not But that's not a negotiation. Here it is. It is, not right. a, it, I mean, it is not a concession to keep the government open. It is not a concession to pay America's bills. That is a responsibility. And as I uh, emailed with a reporter out here, it is enshrined in the Constitution. The Congress has the power to pay debts. Congress has the power uh, to authorize funding. Uh, the, if, if it were otherwise, the President would go about it, and there would be no drama and no delay. So last question. Uh, what is the President doing over these next several hours to try to keep the government running? Again, it is not, unfortunately, within the President's power to pass legislation on the Hill. Well, what's he doing? The President he said control, that he, he can use the bully. What's he doing over the next The hour? President said just moments ago that uh, he uh, will certainly be, he expects, uh, having conversations with leaders in Congress. Uh, but it is pretty elemental here. There is an option to keep the government open. There is an option to shut it down for ideological reasons. And uh, he would not presume to have uh, the power of persuasion within the House Republican caucus that perhaps John Boehner does or perhaps other leaders in that uh, conference, rather, uh, might have. Let me move around. Chuck. Uh, the President said he was open to negotiating on the budget overall. Mm -hmm. 
So, has been all year long. Okay. And I, I assume it's over a one-year proposition of funding the government, not through the two and three months. Oh, sure. Uh, his his, his proposal. Is that, is that what he's saying, though, is that it's about funding the government for, for 2014? And if he's open and to well, And beyond that, as is, as is reflected in his is budget. That, well, is it, under those circumstances, under that umbrella, mm -hmm. then are, are uh, parts of the law of the health care law part the of president said the other day that he is open to discussions with republicans who are sincere about it ways to improve so he might the affordable care act changes under that set of negotiations just not over crs or debt security. again i'm not going to say that he's open to delaying the individual uh, that, response, because delay. he is not but because that is a deliberate explicitly stated effort to basically eliminate obamacare the medical device tax would qualify in something he'd be open to. I, I'm not going to get into. I'm not going to get into specific things that. But he is certainly willing to negotiate with and discuss with Congress, not under the threat of uh, shutdown or default, uh, ways to improve the Affordable Care Act. That has been the case, uh, and will be the case moving forward. And he is willing and and eager to negotiate with uh, lawmakers in Congress, uh, Republicans who are interested in interested in finding common ground on our budget priorities. And he has demonstrated that all year long. Now remember, if I may. Uh, Republicans insisted as part of the last time that uh, we had a budget negotiation with deadlines at the end of last year uh, that uh, they would not uh, they would move forward with uh, a, a bill that uh, raised taxes on uh, the wealthiest Americans and in, uh, locked into place a permanent tax cut for middle class Americans. Uh, in exchange for that, they uh, insisted that the Senate pass a budget because the House had and the Senate. And, and, the, and the debt and by the way, they they uh, they uh, rose, uh, raised the debt ceiling without drama and delay, no no threat of default, but they uh, insisted as part of this there that the Senate pass a budget. They were hopping mad about the fact that the Senate had not passed a budget because the House had passed a budget, and so the Senate passed a budget because John Boehner said he wanted regular order in the Congress, and that's how it should be. House ought to pass a budget, the Senate ought to pass a budget, the two sides ought to come together in conference and try to work out their differences, produce a compromise budget that could then uh, move forward. Now, so Senate upheld its obligation. Senator Murray did an excellent job moving a bill forward, passing a budget through the Senate uh, with uh, Leader Reid, uh, and it has languished ever since with the House refusing, House leaders refusing to do what they said they would do, which is appoint conferees. So how, how here we are, the President all year long has put forward a budget proposal that is filled with compromises, filled with uh, Demonstrative, demonstrable effort, and a demonstrable effort to find common ground, and, and Republicans won't even uh, negotiate over that. Instead, they are obsessed with uh, refighting an old battle from a couple of Congresses ago, which was the the, the uh, debate about the Affordable Care Act and its passage, and the fact that it was signed into law, and the fact that it was upheld by the Supreme Court, and the fact that it was a subject of heightened debate during <coughs> the presidential election, and uh, the candidate who supported the Affordable Care Act was reelected. Can I ask you about the NSA story? It seems like every week there's a new uh, discovery of NSA doing something that you guys swear NSA wasn't doing. And in this case, following innocent Americans and their social networks and creating this apparently labyrinth uh, uh, graph of how they create networks. Can you look at this with a straight face and say this isn't sort of going a step beyond what you guys have said NSA was? Well, doing? what I can tell you is uh, NSA's activities are directed against foreign intelligence targets in order to protect the nation and its interests from threats such as terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. What I cannot do uh, is comment publicly on every specific alleged intelligence activity. But as a matter of policy, we have made clear that we do what other nations do, which is gather foreign intelligence. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. And this is about uh, not against. This is about Americans. Look, I think this that, is about Americans that are not foreign that, that went beyond this, and that's what you know. Well, this, that, I think again. Are you denying that it was the case? I'm saying that I'm not going to dis, uh, discuss specific tools or processes, but as you know, NSA's activities are directed against foreign intelligence targets in order to protect the nation and its interests from threats such as terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. NSA's foreign intelligence activities are conducted pursuant to procedures approved by the United States Attorney General and the Secretary of Defense, and where applicable, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. 
to protect the privacy interests of Americans. Okay, I understand that that's what you have to say, and that that's a statement you have to say. But are you at all concerned that it went beyond this? That it appears that again, it, I'm not going to address. It was supposed to be about foreign. It was supposed to be about addressing people that have potential connections overseas. But this went a step beyond. It, yeah. that, that's the. It went beyond what you just said. Chuck, it. again, I'm not going to address a specific allegation. What I will say is uh, note what the president said in his speech at the United Nations General Assembly, uh, which is that we have begun to review the way that we gather intelligence so that we properly balance the legitimate cons security concerns of our citizens and allies uh, with the privacy concerns that all people share. Uh, and that process is underway. We're going to continue to get this drip, drip, drip out of NSA, which is you tell us a certain amount, something gets leaked by Snowden. Chuck, again, and I. Then, and then you guys acknowledge, okay, we were doing that. I mean, is that how this cat and mouse game is going to work for a while? Chuck, I, I, again, I'm not going to talk about specific <coughs> things. Carol. And then Major. To the President's eagerness to negotiate a long term budget deal. Mm -hmm. When you when he says that, what what's the window for that? And is that an offer to sit down and have negotiations with Republicans? Is that does that happen after the CR, before the debt ceiling? Like what are the qualifications around Good. negotiating something long term? Well, it's an offer that's been on the table for the whole year, virtually, or since the end of the year last year when the well, it's just an open ended offer. Is he gonna I, I think the president has demonstrated that he is open to and eager to negotiate with Republicans who want to find common ground and are willing to compromise when it comes to how we best fund our government in a way that invests in areas that help our economy grow and help our middle class be more secure, uh, but also reduces our uh, deficits and debt in a responsible way. And, and that is reflected in his budget proposal. Uh, it is. Uh, the, it was the central topic of the many conversations the President had and, and, and the Vice President and the Chief of Staff and many others had with Republicans over the course of the year, especially earlier in the year when uh, we were hopeful that there was a willingness by Republicans to find common ground, when we were hopeful that there might uh, be uh, sincerity behind the uh, assertion by Republicans that all they really wanted was the Senate to pass a budget and then there could be a conference and we could reach a compromise. Uh, but yes, that offer remains on the table. So if he's so eager to do it, are we going to see a big put and renewed push by him in the next couple Again, of he weeks is, and months? It, it, this, a negotiation is not a one-way proposition. The President has put forward ideas. The Speaker, each time he addresses any budget issue, keeps moving further and further away. So when he first came forward with an idea that he would fund uh, a proposition where he would have a continuing resolution that uh, allowed for a clean uh, continuance of funding for the government. He backed away from that under pressure from the, 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 time, the small faction or the uh, less than majority faction within his conference. Uh, and instead, you know, launched off on this effort to try to appease uh, the extreme wing of his party that wants, uh, is focused not on reducing the deficit, not on uh, dealing with our long-term debt, uh, but on, you know, this going after this piece of legislation that the President passed. Be any no, I didn't push. say that. I think the president. Well, you just said that today. But usually, when he's Carol, eager to do something, we see you know a big sure. Move. And so should we expect something like not that? Not under threat of shutdown. Not under threat of default. But if the Republicans are serious okay. about negotiating uh, the priorities that we have as a nation to fund uh, through congressional appropriations, yes. And he has been willing to do it all year long and has sought partners in trying to do that and had many good meetings uh, with uh, Republicans who expressed interest in doing that. Unfortunately, we haven't seen uh, anything concrete from Republicans that represents the same uh, spirit of and uh, substantive reflection of compromise that the President's budget represents. Yeah. Major. I understand Senator McConnell's idea has just been floated, but it's not very intricate. It's very simple. It's one week clean CR. I, I get it, Major, but here I am. You guys have Blackberries. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to respond to everything that you say is is showing up on your Blackberries. I don't have a specific response to an idea that's floated. I'm not going to rule in or out anything that I don't have uh, uh, specific uh, in, you know information on that I haven't gotten myself. So what I can tell you, yeah, I should have a little action up here. But the um, mechanism to keep the government. We can do this. Other people want. I mean, I, I don't have a reaction to. A floated proposal from the yeah, now empty seat on the front row, or from <laughs> CNN. 
uh, but he, I mean, uh, but our position is the same. Like we will obviously see what happens in Congress, uh, and the president made clear just now in the Oval Office what uh, his view is, which is that the responsible thing to do is for uh, the House to uh, s not engage in this partisan, partisan brinkmanship, brinksmanship, but to rather uh, responsibly pass a bill that extends funding at current levels of our government operations so that it does not shut, shut down and that, it, and that it does not have the negative effects that I went through before. You said a moment ago to Chuck that if it's a good idea, the president's open to it on the health care law. Is eliminating the medical device tax? No, we don't. Idea? We don't. We don't. We don't believe that is a good idea. It is obviously part of the Affordable Care Act. But I'm not here, Major. As as interesting as it might be, we've already said we would not support that as part of any deal to shut down. The, you know, a threat of okay. shutting down. So I'm not. I'm not going to get into future hypothetical negotiations that the Republicans have thus far all year long not shown themselves interested in holding. We'll see what happens if the Republicans change their mind and want to have serious substantive negotiations about how we find common ground to fund our budget priorities, reduce our deficit in a responsible way, and protect the middle class. What we have seen so far from Republicans concretely in their budget proposals uh, are ideas that do the opposite, that uh, protect special interests with their tax breaks, that stick it to the middle class, and that it, of course, uh, uh, you know, defund or, or repeal the Affordable Care Act, which, by the way, is a huge budget buster, uh, re increases the deficit. Benjamin Netanyahu said with the President that he would be in favor of stronger sanctions if the negotiations with Iran either drag on or prove less than fruit. Mm -hmm. President support that. Look, look, our position, the President's position from the day he took office and made clear that he was willing to have bilateral conversations with Iran uh, if Iran were serious about resolving this issue, uh, is that absent progress on that issue, uh, absent a willingness by Iran to deal with this uh, nuclear weapons problem, uh, that uh, the international community ought to uh, isolate uh, Iran through sanctions and, and make clear through sanctions and other means that uh, the violation of its international obligations was a serious matter, and that is what we have done. And so uh, another way of asking that, which, which I can answer, is uh, you know, the sanctions regime has brought us to this point. The international consensus that the sanctions regime uh, that was made possible by the, uh, sorry, this, <laughs> the international consensus was made possible by the President's position. Uh, we were able to change the focus of the international community from uh, a debate about whether the, the United States was part of the problem uh, to a focus on the fact that Iran was the problem. And through the last five years, we've seen the imposition and steady escalation of sanctions in a way that has had a dramatic impact on the Iranian economy. And I think we've seen reflections of that in the statements of uh, members of the new government. We are encouraged by what we have heard from the uh, new Iranian leadership. Uh, but as we've said all along, uh, actions uh, are what we are focused on. And uh, there, were, uh, there was a P5 plus 1 meeting in which Secretary Kerry uh, and his Iranian counterpart participated. They had a separate pull aside. Uh, and there is another P5 plus one meeting uh, coming up in about 16 days. Uh, so uh, that is the vehicle through which we will be able to measure concrete progress and uh, you know, test the theory here that Iran is serious, as Iran has said it is, about resolving this issue in a way that meets its international commitments. And if it's not stronger sanctions. Again, I think that we're certainly not going to give sanctions relief uh, absent action we'll by intensified. Okay. It's hard for me to, we have steadily over the past five years strengthened and intensified uh, with our partners around the world the sanctions regime against Iran. I think right now we're exploring the possibility that uh, Iran is serious about resolving this challenge and we want to do that. Jay, you're saying that you don't know obviously whether or not Iran will follow through on their promises, but the president did call the new president on Friday mm -hmm. uh, of Iran and sort of opened up diplomatic negotiations. So why not do the same with the House Republicans? You're at loggerheads. Call them. Bring them I over. I love the <laughs> reassertion of GOP talking points. But the, um, I'm sorry. Let's, why don't you at least talk to them? Even let's, if they're wrong. Can I remind you that it was the Speaker of the House in several venues who said at the beginning of this year that he would never negotiate with the President again, that he felt uh, uh, so doing so him burned him, call I him suppose. Bring him over here and force I, him I think, And maybe you didn't catch up to what the President just said, but he said he would be talking to leaders uh, of Congress. Uh, so why is there and, not a meeting today? Um, again, I have nothing 
uh, new to report on the President's schedule, uh, but uh, the House of Representatives could have in the past, a few days ago, and could today, very easily avoid shutting down the government by passing a clean continuing resolution that extends uh, uh, funding of the government uh, for several weeks into the future, allowing for further negotiation about our budget priorities. You know, you know, even Fox has reported this, that the Speaker had one approach he wanted to take, and then, you know, the Tea Party yanked him in the other direction. And we've, see, we've seen uh, a, a number of Republicans, including in the House, uh, say uh, that they believe if the Speaker would just put on the floor of the Senate bill, a clean CR, that it would get a majority in the House, including the votes from the Republican Party necessary. So what we have here, if these Republican lawmakers, uh, Raul Labrador, Charlie Dent, Tom Cole, and others are, are accurate, what we have is a proposition here where majorities of both houses are absolutely willing to pass clean uh, continuing resolutions. And for non-governmental uh, folks out there, that just means, you know, legislation that keeps the government open without any ideological riders attached or imperatives attached. Majorities in both houses. So the issue then is, will the Speaker of the House do that or will he shut down the government? Because there's a majority in both houses to do it. We saw it in the Senate. We know it exists in the House. Um, and uh, you know, so this, this should not be about uh, the internal politics of the House Republican Conference because it's too serious. Right, so that's their problem. For you, you're saying the President's position is he's in favor of a long-term budget deal. How do you get a long-term budget deal without actually sitting down with anyone to Again, hammer that Again, the out? President has met with and spoken with uh, countless Republicans this year, including the Speaker of the House, uh, and has made clear in concrete ways through his budget proposals and through his offer to Speaker Boehner at the end of last year. Uh, his seriousness about compromise, his willingness to make tough choices uh, when it comes to resolving our differences and funding our priorities, protecting the middle class, and dealing with our deficits, continuing to bring down our deficits, which, by the way, have been falling at the most precipitous rate since the end of World War II. Uh, again, not a talking point you often hear from the Republican Party, uh, just as you don't often hear in midst all this debate claims by the Republicans that this is about deficits or debt anymore. It's about, it can't be, because doing most of what they insist we do with their demands would actually increase the deficit and debt rather than decrease it. So uh, I guess that's not their main priority anymore. It, it's some, the, 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 their objective now is focused entirely on uh, trying to prevent the implementation of a law that passed Congress, was signed by, into law by the President, was upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, and validated across the nation in a presidential election. Roger. Uh, <clears throat> 17 years ago, we had another government shutdown, and we had people like Gene Sperling and Sylvia Burwell um, and Jack Lew were around at that time. Have they offered So was any, I. Oh, but yeah. in a different capacity. Yes, indeed. They were in government. Uh, have they offered any sort of lessons learned from that and, and applied <coughs> them to today's situation at all? Uh, yes. You know, but we've been through this already several times. Uh, in terms of the prospect of uh, shutdown or default, uh, and and uh, most uh, of the people you named, with the exception of Sylvia, uh, were here, including Bruce Reed and others, um, uh, for parts of that. So uh, I think a lot of people here are, remember uh, the vice president and others. Uh, uh, you know what happened in '95 and '96, uh, but you know obviously this is a new and different time and. You know, we're focused on 2013. We're focused on the middle class today, uh, the seniors and women and children who would be affected if there's a shutdown, the veterans whose call centers would close effective 1201 uh, October 1st uh, if there's a shutdown. So, uh, you know, that's that's the president's priority. So you're, you're saying it was it's quite a bit different today than it well, was back I mean, in that time. I, 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 yes, not to say that past experience for all of us isn't a useful. Thing to have when contemplating the future. Jackie. Um, when there's a lot of Democrats who sit, think that the President has made a concession in just extending current spending, which is at sequestration rates, and um, <coughs> their fear is that this will be whatever comes out of this, if there is a long-term agreement, would, would lock in sequestration mm -hmm. for another year. 
Um, can you rule out for the president that he would ever agree to uh, another year's extension of sequestration? Uh, Jackie, it's uh, a fair question, but I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of where we are now, which is focusing on uh, Congress's responsibility to ensure that the government doesn't shut down. Uh, the ease with which the House could do it by simply extending uh, funding at current levels, as you mentioned, uh, for a short period of time to allow for further negotiation uh, and to uh, not make this about uh, a partisan wish list, uh, attaching things to uh, Congress's essential responsibility that the Republicans, the Tea Party Republicans can't get otherwise, uh, and that the American people rejected uh, in an election. Uh, so, uh, you know, the President has put forward a budget. I know you and others have, have looked at it and you know what his priorities are, you know where he's been willing to compromise, and he is willing to have those conversations. He did not put that budget forward and say, I get this, uh, or there's no negotiation. That's not the approach he takes. It's often, at times, the approach Republicans take. Uh, he understands that, uh, you know, this requires compromise and finding common ground. Uh, but what he won't do and what he will, has never uh, suggested he would do is, you know, reduce our deficit in a way uh, that puts all the burden on the middle class or all the burden on our seniors or all the burden on children uh, uh, through uh, underfunding their educational opportunities. So, uh, you know, there's a way to do this responsibly. The President's demonstrated over the course of the last five years almost that uh, you can inherit the largest deficits in our history, the worst financial crisis in our history, or close to it, uh, certainly in our lifetimes manage those challenges, steady our economy, save the automobile industry, see the economy begin to grow and create jobs, see it create seven and a half million private sector jobs, do all that, pass uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, was a goal of members of both parties for a century, including Republican presidents, and uh, see our deficits come down by half at a rate we haven't seen since the 1940s. Uh, so his record's pretty good on this, and through a willingness to compromise, uh, we can move forward and do more uh, in a way that allows our economy to grow and allows it to invest in the middle class. Uh, David, you have three big things on the agenda, this uh, shutdown watch, the uh, health care, even the health care open enrollment starting, and a visit by the Israeli Prime Minister. Can you give a sense of what sort of the atmosphere is like in the, is it, feel like a busier than usual day? Is it, is it tense? What's it like back there? Well, it's, it's busy, it's, uh, but it's always busy here. It's busy for, for most of you in covering uh, this White House and any White House. And, uh, you know, we're very much focused on making sure that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act continues, and it will, uh, making sure that the uh, enrollment period that opens tomorrow uh, opens and continues for six months, and it will, uh, and, and making as, uh, as much as we can uh, information about that available to the public, to those millions of Americans and their families who will now have the opportunity to uh, shop for affordable health insurance for the first time. And, and then on the, on the foreign policy side, you know, as the President noted, I, I, I think we, we may have done this count, I can't remember, but I think it's fairly, I think it's accurate to say that President Obama has met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and spoken with Prime Minister Netanyahu more than he has any other foreign leader. Uh, and that, that reflects the closeness of the relationship uh, between our two nations, the United States' uh, commitment to Israel's security, and the, uh, the importance of the issues that uh, the two leaders discussed today, including Syria and Iran, where we've had major developments. So, uh, you know, busy times, to be sure. Jay. Yeah. Looking ahead to tomorrow, what is your level of confidence that this rollout is going to, to be ready and that it's going to uh, rise to the expectations that the President and others uh, have set for it? Well, you would have to evaluate the expectations. It will be ready and it will happen. And, and, and re regardless of what the Republicans do in terms of pursuing their ideological agenda, implementation continues. As those of you who know how this works, uh, the funding for the Affordable Care Act uh, will not uh, be uh, significantly affected by uh, any effort that the Republicans decide to take to shut down the government. Uh, and uh, millions of Americans are going to have available to them the opportunity to enroll uh, in uh, 
these marketplaces and to purchase affordable health care for the first time in years. I mean, their option, you know, we talked about you know, the options available to them in the past, and for, for most of these Americans, uh, you know, they didn't have networks, they didn't have doctors, they had the emergency room. And their kids, when they had an asthma problem, they had the emergency room. Uh, and now they'll have uh, something far better and more reliable available to them, uh, which is health insurance. Are you saying the president has nothing on his schedule regarding this tomorrow? No, I didn't say that at all. I just said I don't have uh, any scheduling announcements to make. Well, is he going to do something? I said I don't have any scheduling announcements to make. No What's it going to say uh, to the public if he doesn't uh, do something? Peter, like this? I, I, again, I'm not going to get in, into a back and forth about what is or is not on his schedule because I don't have any scheduling announcements to make. Yes, Mark. I have a question about the, the government shutdown that Roger talked about 17 years ago. A lot has changed, including some of the provisions that have been put in place to make to cushion the shutdown, to make it less mm -hmm. traumatic. Um, I'm wondering if you have a prediction or you've come to a consensus among yourselves about how long it might take uh, for people to really feel it. I mean, you were, when the sequester happened, there were a lot of predictions from the White House that it would be awful and people would rise up and demand that it ended, and it didn't. I'm wondering if, if the shutdown this time is going to be less catastrophic um, than 17 years ago. Well, I would say a couple of things. There's no question that essential functions, uh, some of them continue. Other, you know, different parts of the uh, uh, federal operations are affected in different ways. Uh, but the, the, the impacts are considerable, and I listed some of them. Uh, but the sort of underpinning of your question sort of supposes that we're approaching this in uh, in terms of how much political pressure will it take for Republicans to do the right thing. And we're hoping maybe zero, and maybe they'll just do the right thing. And, uh, you know, take up the President's year-long, essentially, you know, uh, offer to have substantive negotiations about how we uh, fund the government in a way that helps it grow and create jobs and invest and and uh, and reduce our deficit in, and reduce our deficit in the medium and long term uh, rather than uh, playing this 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 game of uh, that, that that has uh, as its victims primarily regular Americans out there and and I think uh, it's important to note obviously the immediate deadline we face here is the uh, lapse in funding that would occur come midnight but but you know there have been all sorts of suggestions from Republicans on Capitol Hill that uh, they look forward to engaging in this again in just a few short weeks when the consequences would be even more serious, far, far more serious and unknowable in many ways, but bad in every case. Well, I have a question about that, um, which is uh, we were asked this two years ago about if the president had any constitutional recourse if the debt ceiling is, is breached, and at that time you said no, but there have been suggestions that he's going to be violating the Constitution if he lets the debt ceiling breach go into effect, he'll be violating it if it doesn't. I mean, have you taken a new look at this? It's only 17 days away at the legalities of this and what he I mean, I'm not sure what this is when it like comes to breaching the debt ceiling. The Congress has to vote to raise the debt ceiling. The President can't raise it by himself. Uh, people have talked about uh, the 14th Amendment, and this administration does not believe that the 14th Amendment gives the power to ignore the debt ceiling. And even if the President could ignore the debt ceiling, uh, the, fact that, the fact that there is significant, significant controversy around the President's authority to act unilaterally means that it would be, not be a credible alternative to Congress raising the debt ceiling uh, and would not be taken seriously uh, by the global economy and markets, you know, as the President said today. Uh, the reason why this is so serious is because the, the world looks to the United States uh, as uh, uh, the world economic leader and, and, and uh, relies on the stability and good faith and credit of the United States enormously. And it, that is why is it, it is so important to maintain that and never even to flirt with the possibility that it would not be maintained uh, in order to, uh, for any reason, and in this case, in order to achieve uh, this, this uh, narrow political, uh, you know, piece of business that Tea Party Republicans couldn't achieve through other means. Again, we don't, you know, it is up to the Congress to pay the debts of the United States. Congress has the power to do that, according to the Constitution. It is up to the Congress to appropriate funds and ensure that the government remains open and functioning. And the President hopes that Congress takes those responsibilities seriously.
I don't believe that uh, has been the case uh, and is not the case now that, that uh, volunteers or interns would be working. They will not. Uh, all the way in the back of life. Oh, sorry. LA Times. Um, I and then Alexis. So, President, when he campaigned last year, talked a lot about how his reelection would break the fever in Washington. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think <laughs> his analysis is now. Why that didn't happen? Did he? It's pretty stubborn fever, clearly. And that's it? That's what he thinks? Well, I mean, again, I, that's, that's, that's what I, I mean, that's my observation, not his. It, it, I think we all can assess, uh, without anyone's assistance, that uh, Republican intransigence uh, uh, remains quite uh, real. I mean, here we have an opportunity to ensure that the govern government shuts down, does not shut down. Democrats, President, aren't asking for anything. They're not attaching anything to this proposal, not attaching anything to the proposal that Congress fulfill its responsibility uh, to pay the bills of the United States. And yet the prospect of shutdown and the prospect of default are on the table because Republicans want to attach to those fundamental responsibilities uh, you know, highly partisan political agenda items that they have not been able to achieve through the normal legislative process or through the electoral process. That was not a realistic campaign promise. Uh, no, he he hopes and believes that uh, you know common sense will prevail, and that we can get about the business of reaching reasonable compromise uh, when it comes to our budget priorities. Uh, there's no there's no agreement to reach when it comes to the debt ceiling. That is, you know, that should never be flirted with breaching it, and it should never be uh, used uh, as a negotiating ploy, uh, and and. That, that's the president's uh, very firm position. Alexis, last one. Jay, two quick follow-up questions. Just to clarify, by the time that you came out here today, I just want to make sure I understand, the president and the vice president had not had any discussions about the shutdown with leaders as of today. I have no conversations uh, involving the president or the vice president to report to you today. But it's... Uh, Again, I'm not, I don't, we don't read out every conversation. I'm just, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not asking you to parse my words. I'm just saying the president spoke to this, uh, you know, on camera just moments ago. Uh, I don't have anything more beyond that to report. He also has on his schedule today a meeting with the cabinet. Can you elaborate on whether he wants to talk to them about the plans for a responsible shutdown, which is an enormous operation, government-wide? Is that the purpose of the meeting? And, and I, I would simply say that I, I, I expect that that would be uh, a topic, uh, the, 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 the potential for uh, a lapse in funding, uh, uh, but I, I wouldn't rule out other topics. And you also just to add, <coughs> everyone in the federal government who uh, would be expected to either be furloughed or be considered accepted, they know that as of now, correct? I would refer you to OMB in terms of the notification process. But, I'm not sure. Again, I can't speak for every person. Uh, in the yes, in my office, yeah, people know. Everybody. Yeah. Thanks very much.